Okay, so let's start. Um, I hope everybody can see my presentation now. It's a bit confusing. Um, so, yeah, so thank you for attending my, my talk. My name is uh, Helmut Lavac, and um, uh, today I will talk about how to combine coroutines and functions into a job system. A uh, couple of words about myself. I'm professor for computer science uh, and um, I work at the University of Vienna. Um, the Vienna, University of Vienna was founded uh, in uh, 1365, so it's fairly old. We have about 90,000 students. Uh, I do head a group that's called uh, um, Entertainment Computing Research Group, uh, and we do research in the areas of uh, efficiency and performance of, of game engines, of artificial intelligence for games, networking for games, and so on. And I do teach about 3D graphics, AI, physics for games, game streaming, and so on. I'm also a member of the Technical Committee 14 uh, of uh, the IFIP, uh, the International Federation for Information Processing, uh, on the topic of entertainment computing. Now, I do create my own game engines for teaching and research. Uh, so in order to create the next generation of my game engine, I do implement new modules uh, that uh, include the job system that I will present today. Uh, but it also includes other modules like a graphics API abstraction layer, uh, like an entity component system, uh, a type list library, and other parts that I will uh, work on in the future. And um, you can see all of this uh, coming uh, to life on my GitHub. Uh, everything is open and you can have a look if you're interested. Now, uh, typically a game runs in a game so-called game loop. Uh, you probably have heard about it. Uh, typically, you would measure the time. So when you run in this loop, uh, uh, you would in every loop, you would actually measure the time uh, that you spent in the last loop iteration. Uh, so you take the time uh, from, from the last uh, clock time taking, uh, and you, you, you save it in some, some variable, some delta time, and then you would actually try to advance your game state by calling up all of the game, uh, all of the uh, game subsystems. Like uh, you want to have, you ask the window about user events, you ask the network, you ask the physics engine to advance uh, the simulation, uh, the game logic, AI, and so on. And once everything is done and the state of your game has been advanced, uh, you would actually prepare to render the next frame. You can uh, record, for instance, uh, some, uh, some uh, command buffers for that. And then after you're done with that, you would submit it for rendering to the, to the GPU. And then once you're done, you start again at the beginning. Now, that's a lot of work to be done in a very short time. Uh, and, of course, modern multi-core CPUs uh, offer many, many cores nowadays, more than one, certainly. And these are independent cores, and each of, on each core you, ca core you can run uh, one th thread of uh, execution in a MIMD fashion, so multiple instruction, multiple data. Uh, these threads are completely independent of each other. Uh, the cores may share, usually they share the, the same memory in some unified manner and they can also share some caches. And, and sometimes, depending on the CPU architecture, you actually double the number of cores, you get, or you even quadruple the number of cores, you get two, and if you have any independent cores, you get double the, twice the many virtual cores. Uh, that is done in order uh, to let the CPU cores do useful work uh, even if the pipelines stall, and on these architectures, they have complex instruction sets, so pipelines can stall, for instance, waiting for the main mem memory. You can always query the number of cores by calling this function, hardware concurrency, and then you get the number of virtual cores that you, that you have. Um, and so here are a couple of uh, off-the-shelf 
processors that you can buy today, and you see that, for instance, AMD uh, with their Risen Threadripper, Threadripper or Epic line, they can have up to 64 hardware cores, double that, and you have up to 128 virtual cores. And Intel is not far behind. Um, Apple with the M1 is currently offering, as far as I know, four efficient cores and four high-performance cores. Now, um, usually uh, there is only one thread, uh, and if there is one thread, then we run all the systems serially. That means that we go from left to right. Uh, we run through all the, uh, the, the systems, we record, and then uh, the output of the GPU is, uh, output of the recording is given to the GPU. Um, so uh, things, uh, when, when the GPU renders it uh, and it is finished, it will produce an output uh, frame. Uh, and then the whole thing starts again. Uh, and um, uh, when the next frame is uh, presented, then you can take the time, and this is the frame time, or uh, one over the frame, uh, the FPS, the frame rate. And we want to keep the frame time as small as possible, of course. Uh, now, if we make use of many, many cores, as many cores as possible, of course, we can try to parallelize all this work here in these systems. So you end up with all the, uh, all, uh, all the systems running in parallel. Once they are done, uh, you start recording your commands, send them to the GPU, uh, and one, when you record uh, this, this state, uh, then you can actually go and work on the next set, state and so on. And we can see how we can brought down the frame time here just by doing all of this stuff in parallel. Of course, uh, if you just parallelize the systems and run the systems sequentially, uh, then there will be systems that actually dominate uh, this, uh, the time. Uh, and of course, what we want to do is to really to cut down everything into small chunks and really make use of the many cores that we have today, run all of this in parallel. And if we do that, then here the bottleneck, the GPU becomes the bottleneck. But there are many, many tricks even here to, to really make use of the GPU and bring down the frame rate even, even further. So how do we manage using that many threads? Uh, one thing is clear, uh, starting new threads uh, costs a lot of time. And you cannot start a thread for every piece of work that you want to, to work on. So we don't want to start threads all the time. Uh, and uh, we do that by actually starting a fixed number of threads. So for every virtual uh, core, we start a thread, and this number never changes. And this is called a thread pool. Uh, so we start these threads uh, uh, when we start the, the job system, uh, and uh, then the thread pool contains threads that are, act that are continuously searching for work. Um, and uh, we, so we have our thread pool here, uh, and we add a queue. Uh, and then we can put work into the queue and the threads are constantly pulling the queue or they are woken up when something is in the queue and then they can start working on it. Now, traditionally, uh, in many game architectures, you would have something like a main thread uh, that advances uh, the, the whole uh, simulation and that acts like as a synchronization um, synchronization element. So the main thread would, for instance, call parallel for, parallelize something, um, put the work into a queue. Uh, the threads can grab the work, work on it, and once everything is done, you return to the main thread. And uh, while uh, the work is being done, uh, the main thread is blocking, and it will be uh, woken, and, and it will be uh, remain its uh, work when everything is done. Uh, also, you might have yet another thread, uh, either for rendering, as we've seen, or for a low priority thread for uh, for loading assets from disk, for instance, and that can take some time. Uh, so usually, this is put into yet another thread uh, that is running in parallel. Also, there will be dependencies between systems, of course, uh, but also inside of systems. So for instance, if you look at physics, at the physics simulation, um, 
in the physics simulation, usually you would start by uh, detecting collisions between objects, and when you find collisions, you would respond to this and re would resolve these collisions, and then you'd integrate your equations of motion. So you have phases, you go through these phases sequentially, uh, and you have these dependencies. So uh, you, ca uh, you can only go here when this is finished. Um, so you, you really have to mind these uh, going through here. So um, when we want to parallelize uh, here these, uh, these phases also, what we can do, of course, is again cut down uh, the work here in independent chunks. Uh, this can be done quite easily for collision detection, for instance. And then you would s s start spawning these work, work jobs. Uh, they would work on it and you would wait for the result. Once the results are here, you again spawn uh, some some jobs, wait for the results, and so on. So we, here we have a, a, a pattern where you create work and then uh, wait for this work. Now, because this is running on the thread pool, what we cannot do here is to a blocking wait, uh, because if this, um, if this, uh, the physics engine here is a blocking wait, it actually blocks the whole thread, and because we have only a limited number of threads. Um, then uh, it actually takes away a thread out of the thread pool, so we cannot make a blocking weight. Instead, what we have to do is to take this off the thread and schedule a so-called continuation. So once the, the work is done, the continuation will be scheduled and can, can follow up this work and can schedule more work. Uh, again, we schedule a continuation, uh, and once uh, we schedule the continuation, we have to take uh, this this uh, job away from the thread in order to free up the thread. Now, uh, if you look at this scheme, we see a lot of, of threads in the thread pool. We see a main thread, we see other threads, and we can ask, uh, do we really need uh, these extra threads here? Do we need the main thread? Do we need a render thread? Do we need an I.O. Uh, thread? And uh, the answer is actually no. This is a... Uh, this is a site uh, from Axel Knighting from IT Software from 2020. Fun fact, Doom Eternal does not have a main or render thread. It's all jobs with one worker thread per core. So we can actually get rid of that. And we can start improving on our system. Uh, we can uh, restrict our system to a thread pool only system, only worker threads. There is no main thread, there is no render thread. Every th every, all the work is done. Uh, on the worker threads, there is a, there might be a global queue, and the workers are actually always tr uh, creating other work put into the uh, into this global queue, and other workers can can take it out. Now um, we can improve even further and say that every thread gets its own globally visible queue, work queue, um, and and that uh, takes away this this center here, this central bottleneck. And because now work is, is, uh, is uh, really put into many different queues, there is no bottleneck here anymore. And all the, queue, all the threads are actually taking word out of their own queue. But what if they run out of work? Well, they can actually steal work from other queues. That's called work stealing. So you can steal jobs from other global queues. And by that, you reach uh, load balancing. You, so you can really nicely distribute the work over all the worker threads. And finally, we can even go further and say that some of these queues are global queues, so you can steal work from them, but every thread also gets what I call a local queue, and when work arrives in a local queue, you cannot steal it. So only the thread that owns the local queue can take work out of it. That makes sense sometimes when you interact with, uh, with um, systems like GLFW, a windowing system, uh, and you can uh, interact only from the main thread. So only the thread that was started when you started your program can interact with that. So you really have to force all the work that interacts with GLFW onto uh, one specific thread. So we can have these locally and globally visible queues, and work stealing is only going on from the global queues. Another idea is, uh, comes from the observation uh, that um, games can go through phases. Uh, as we have seen with uh, the, the physics engine, 
also the whole game can go through a phase. So it could start, for instance, by allocating memories for memory, more memory for a new state. Uh, then it can run all the systems and finally it can do some garbage collection and throwing things away and cleaning up. And again, these phases can be done uh, sequentially, one after another. Um, so, uh, but sometimes you might want to schedule something that is to be processed only in an upcoming uh, phase and not in the current phase. So if you're in the current phase one, and if I schedule anything in phase one, it will be immediately worked on. Uh, but um, I might want to schedule something that is worked on in, in phase two or in the last phase when I do my garbage collection. So I can put a tag on it and say, okay, uh, schedule this, but only sc uh, but work on it in the next phase. And in the next phase, what I can do is then I, I can schedule this tag, like tag two, and all the jobs that have been previously scheduled to this phase will get scheduled in, in one big run. Uh, so and 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 so you can really schedule things to run later on in your in your game. Uh, all of these ideas have been implemented by myself in uh, the Vienna Game Job System, which is. Uh, my own take on an experimental job system for teaching and research. Uh, you can see it in my GitHub um, under Vienna Game Job System. Um, all of these ideas have been implemented. It's, it's, it's uh, meant for to, to act as a thread pool only. The main thread can enter the thread pool as a worker. Uh, it's, you only need include files, uh, that's all you need. Uh, it uses work stealing uh, with one local and one global queue per thread. You can use text scheduling uh, to schedule for, for later phases. Uh, you can allocate everything, including also the coroutines, either directly from the heap or you can specify a memory resource and the memory resource will then satisfy all the memory allocations. Uh, you can log the performance and visualize it. Uh, you can you can save it as a JSON and visualize it by using the Chrome uh, tracing uh, possibility. And you can use these three functions to schedule new jobs. You can uh, in, inside a function, uh, you can use schedule and continuation, and inside a coroutine, uh, you would use a co-await, which is uh, which is reserved for. Coroutines, and so we have this interaction between functions and coroutines uh, that makes it uh, quite challenging to 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 design such a such a system. Now um, we said I said that there, uh, there are lots of threads running, and and all of these threads are actually are running through this um, through this thread loop. So every thread starts its task and then it, it will run through the, this while loop un, until the job system is terminated. So the threads uh, will constantly look into their queues. First, they will look into their local queue and try to get a, a job from the local queue. If they didn't, if, if this is empty, uh, they will look into their global queue, try to get a job there. And if they didn't find anything, then uh, they will try to steal a, a, jo a, a job from the global queue of another thread. And they can try this for a while, but um, they can also run out of tries. Um, and either they then found a job, when they found a job, they can execute it, they run the job, and if they didn't find a job, then they simply go to sleep and they will be awoken once new jobs arrive. Now, if you run a job, it can be a function, for instance, of course, this simply starts the function, function will have its local variables, uh, and finally, the function will return. Uh, and when it returns, you come out here in the thread loop, and you will uh, continue again uh, in, this, uh, in this loop uh, and try to find more work to be done. So uh, what can we schedule? So uh, we can schedule normal functions and functors uh, as uh, the standard allows. We can, uh, we can schedule a lambda and enclose, enclose some parameters in the lambda. We can schedule a function, a std function, the output of a std bind. We can schedule a function pointer. We can schedule uh, the, uh, an instance of this function class uh, this which uh, holds not only a std function, but you can also specify the thread you want to run it on and type and ID which is used for logging. 
So here, by specifying thread zero, then you can make sure that this function is put into the local queue of thread zero. And also, we can schedule tags, uh, and that makes all the, the pre-scheduled jobs uh, to run uh, that have been pre uh, scheduled with the, this tag. Also, we can schedule coroutines, um, and um, the type uh, that we actually schedule is um, derived from this. So this is the return type of the coroutine. It's called coro, just to, dis, uh, to make a distinction between functions and coroutines. And also you can say that the coroutine should return some return type, some return value. Uh, so for instance, the float or an int or whatever you want the coroutine to give back to you. Also, you can specify a thread and the type and ID just by calling the return object and specifying this. We can also specify also a tuple uh, containing um, all of these things uh, in, in various orders. Uh, this is used mainly uh, with coroutines, with a coroutine await, and you can specify a vector that containing an arbitrary number of them. Now, I talked about continuations and about dependencies. Uh, so, but first, we, if you want to talk about dependencies and continuation, we have to define when this should happen. Now, we define um, a job that finishes when it actually calls return, and all of its jobs, its children have finished. Uh, it has a counter for that, and if all the ch children have finished, the counter is zero. Uh, and then it will notify its parent uh, to say, okay, I'm, I'm your child and I've finished. And if there was a continuation, then uh, also this continuation will be scheduled. So uh, looking at a couple of examples here, uh, first we have a job that is active, it will run schedule, it will schedule some, some children, so the counter goes up, uh, then it can schedule some continuation, uh, then uh, the children can schedule again something, this counter goes up, uh, then this could return. Uh, it doesn't mean that it vanishes, it simply decreases its, its counter and it, ge it gets inactive. Uh, then the children can return uh, again, uh, this one gets inactive but it still has a child, so it has to wait for This one gets zero, so it is actually finishing. And when this returns and all of this uh, finishes, uh, then finally, uh, also the initial job finishes and it will schedule its own continuation and the continuation will then run and uh, progress the simulation. Um, here we see some examples on how we can schedule jobs uh, in VGJS. Uh, so let's say that there is a test function and it, uh, it, there is a driver function and an end function. And the test function now can call schedule to schedule uh, one job uh, that con consists of this driver function. And we do this by specifying a lambda and we encode this, uh, this, uh, this parameter here in this lambda. We can also create a function here. Again, the function contains, is, uh, contains a is made out of a lambda and we can schedule the function, the std function. We can schedule the result of a std bind. Uh, we can schedule a function instance, and here we can schedule, we can specify also uh, that uh, this function driver here should run on thread zero, and for the logging purposes, you, you can return, uh, you can log a, a specific type and a specific, specific ID. And finally, as continuation, when all of these have finished, you can then schedule this uh, end function. Uh, and then after all have been finished, the end will run uh, and continue this call chain. Now, uh, using this type of continuation can re result in kind of a sp spaghetti code, uh, and we don't want to do this too much. Um, uh, luckily, we can use coroutines, which are their own continuation, and that's really very uh, nice uh, uh, when you want to use coroutines um, that they, they provide this possibility. Now, what is the difference between a normal function and a coroutine? A normal function, uh, when you call it, uh, it will create uh, its own stack uh, frame and it will have its own local uh, state on the stack. But once the function calls return, uh, the stack memory is removed and the state is gone. Now, in contrast, a coroutine can actually run, and in the middle of its execution, it can suspend its state and, re and return to it the caller. 
Uh, and after after some some time, anybody who owns the handle of the coroutine can resume it, and the coroutine simply continues its running right at, at the point where it's uh, suspended with the same state. So that's really an awesome feature, and we can make use of that. Um, but first, when you when you you have to uh, reserve some memory where you can actually store the state of, for the coroutine. And of course, you will uh, allocate some heap memory for that. And that is done when the coroutine is first called. So you call it, uh, then this coroutine frame, uh, uh, the memory is allocated, and then you, then you fill out the coroutine frame, create something there, we will come to this. Uh, when you call suspend, the stuck frame, the current stack frame, is copied to the coroutine frame, and the coroutine returns to the caller. And after some time, somebody might resume the coroutine, meaning that the coroutine frame is copied back to the stack frame, and then you resume it. And finally, of course, you can destroy it by using a handle, and that would deallocate this uh, coroutine frame. So when you allocate something, you have to deallocate it also. So here we see some call. Uh, some call patterns. Uh, here we have a function calling a coroutine C, uh, and so th th it calls the coroutine, uh, and the coroutine might call, for instance, co-yield, which uh, uh, suspends the coroutine. The coroutine is suspended. Uh, it comes back to the caller. Uh, the caller has a handle for this coroutine, uh, and call resume on this handle, and then the coroutine is, uh, can, can actually go on right in the middle where it's suspended, it will go on, and finally when it calls co-return, it will uh, destroy itself. Now, uh, here is a here's a, an example where you involve two threads, so now we have one function and two coroutines, uh, and the function calls the coroutine, the coroutine is created, and then the coroutine could uh, call co-await. Uh, which creates on another thread uh, another coroutine. Uh, and as we see, the C1 actually is suspended and it will re return to its caller and the caller goes on. Uh, but when you co-await, you can actually pass on the handle of this co uh, coroutine to this coroutine. So when this coroutine now goes on and it can decide to resume this coroutine because it has the handle. It got the handle and it calls resume here. Uh, which means that itself it called co-await, uh, and inside the co-await it calls a resume. Uh, so uh, C2 is gets suspended, C1 gets resumed, and so on. So you can really have this ping-pong calling pattern. This is one of the patterns that you can have. Uh, but um, uh, coroutines in VJJS, they have a, a kind of a specific way uh, how they deal with that. Now you create the coroutine by calling it, uh, but you have to schedule it. So you get a return object, and then you have to put it into a schedule uh, or into continuation, uh, or you put it to a co-await operator, and then uh, the coroutine gets actually uh, uh, put into the queue. Uh, you can also call this like parallel, which is simply, simply a wrapper about uh, a tuple, so you can create a tuple out of many of these objects and give it to co-await, and all of them will then be put into queues. And once they are in a queue, uh, grabs, uh, threads will grab them and will resume the coroutines, and the coroutines will go on and run on these other threads. So here we have an example of, of coroutines. Uh, we start with a function test. Uh, then we have two coroutines, one driver coroutine and one called corotest. Uh, and um, in the function test, we create this coroutine by just calling it. And then we schedule it, we schedule the return object. Uh, and actually not the return object itself will be scheduled, but the promise that is attached to it. And we will see this later on, how this actually interacts. So we schedule uh, this coroutine. And since we're in a function, we're just going on. The function doesn't have any way to, to, uh, to suspend. Uh, and, but the function can actually ask, um, is there any uh, result yet? Because a coroutine can return a result. And the function can ask, can run ready, is the result here? And if the result is here, we can get it. But if the result is not here, the function can do whatever it wants and can return. So function and coroutines are totally out of sync here. There's no, uh, no meaningful way to, to synchronize them. 
Now, um, in contrast, when the coroutine runs, it can co-await another coroutine. And uh, that means that um, this coroutine now is created because you call it, you get a return object, you put the return object uh, into a queue, and because you called co-await, the driver function suspends at this point and uh, gets back to the thread loop. So the driver is really now hanging into the, in the air. Uh, it doesn't do anything, it's suspended. Um, and um, this function, coroutest, will be executed and it can do some co-awaits of its own. It can change the thread it's running on and so on. Uh, but finally, when it either co-yields or co-returns, uh, it will notify its parent. The parent will count down the number of children. And when this uh, is zero, which in this case it would be zero, it would actually be rescheduled. So all the children finish, meaning that this uh, coroutine is rescheduled and will be resumed here and will go on here, uh, meaning that the coroutine, in fact, is its own continuation. And that's a nice thing. So looking behind the scene, uh, what's actually happening when this is done? So we have our test function, it calls the driver function, it creates the coroutine. So when you call it, you create the coroutine frame and there's a lot of stuff on the coroutine frame. You have a suspend point, function parameters, uh, the uh, stack frame memory. Then you want to create a promise. The promise alters the behavior of a coroutine but we don't know the, uh, the, uh, the type of the promise yet. So where is the type? What, what would we have? Uh, uh, what is the type of the promise? Uh, the, type of the, pro the type of the promise is given by this one, by the, by the re return object. And somewhere in the return object, you have this statement, using promise type coro promise. So this is, uh, of course, VGGA is specific to use this promise type. So the, so the compiler figures out, OK, you want this return type, so I have to create this promise type, and it will create a promise instance of that. Uh, and finally, when uh, this first uh, suspends, it will create uh, the promise at uh, the return object, and then you get the return object. So this is like uh, the cycle that you go through. Now you have this promise here, and the promise is now really here to alter, to define uh, what's going on in, in this coroutine. Now we see that this coroutine actually is what we've been creating, what we've been writing, but the compiler will insert more code. This is actually the code that, the com that will be run. So and this is inserted by the compiler. There is a, a, another co-await here at the start and another co-await here at the end. So we have more co-awaits now. Uh, and each and every one of these co-awaits, uh, we have here also a co-await, needs an awaiter. So we have return object, we have the promise, and we need awaiters uh, uh, to manage these co-awaits. So when we co-await, uh, so when we call the next function, coroutest, we again construct uh, this, uh, the, the coroutine frame with the, with the promise, uh, with the coroutest uh, inside. Uh, then we co-await it. We, it means we need an awaiter to manage that. Um, then coroutest, uh, this will suspend. A coroutest will run. Uh, it does itself. It does itself core, some core awaits and some uh, core return. They need an awaiter. Finally, they need an awaiter because when they do coroutine, you come here, you run into core await, uh, final suspend, you need, a, you need an awaiter. Um, coroutine would also return a result, the result value. Uh, and once you come back here, uh, so once you, when you coroutine, uh, you return, uh, this will suspend. It will wake up its own parent. The parent will be rescheduled and it will get the result. And once you hit coroutine here, return here, uh, you will jump to final suspend and co-await once more uh, here this awaiter uh, and determine what you want to do. So we have this triangle of uh, classes that you can come up with and provide. So the, as a programmer, you can specify, specify your own classes, your own functionality uh, in the return object for the caller, the promise that adapts the coroutine and that determines uh, which awaiters to choose, 
and uh, the awaiters themselves. And the awaiters manage now one of these co-await calls. And they do this by determining what you do when you suspend and resume. So let's start with the return object. We have seen that the return object is something that you uh, get when you call the coroutine for the first time. Um, it specifies the promise type, but the return object is actually created by the promise. So it's, um, it's really uh, by calling get return object and it's returned to the caller upon the first suspension point. So if this is our function, we call the coroutine and at the first suspension point, we come here back, get the, get the return object and can advance here. Now, the return object uh, will let the caller be able to communicate with uh, the coroutine or with the, with the promise of the coroutine. So the caller gets the return object and in VGGS we can do a couple of things here. We can test whether the result is ready. So the result is already here. We can, if it is ready, we can get the result. We can get the pointer to the promise. Uh, we can resume the coroutine if you want to. And we can set the thread index, the type, and the ID. So we can do lots of stuff here. But this is uh, VGGS specific. So this is because I implemented it this way. Now the promise are, promises are different. Promises alter the behavior of coroutines uh, through an API. Uh, and that means that any class that offers this API or these functions can uh, be used as a promise. Uh, the promise is created when you first call the coroutine uh, and it's part of the coroutine frame. Uh, the return object determines what type of pro promise you want to create by using this promise type, but the promise creates the return type when it is called. Now, um, promises are destroyed, of course, when the coroutine frame gets destroyed. So let's have a look at the promise API and what uh, VGJS um, uh, actually uses of it. So this is a promise type that uh, is implemented for VGJS, and it has to offer a couple of functions that influence the behavior of the coroutine. So first, what we do is uh, we, um, we first uh, await the, uh, the result of in the initial suspense. So remember that the compiler will insert code here. When you run a coroutine, the first thing you do is you co-await an awaiter that gets back from initial suspend function. And the initial suspend function is part of the promise. So the promise has to come up with an initial suspend function and the promise uh, will give you a, um, an awaiter. And in this case, it's a, the awaiter is, has a, st a standard behavior and it's called suspend always. So it always suspends. When you call a co coroutine uh, in VJGS, it will always suspend and immediately return. So the coroutine will not advance here. Uh, also, you have to provide this function get return object in order to create uh, then the return object. So this is done when you when you first call the coroutine. Now, um, also you have to do some stuff when you co-return. When you leave the coroutine, you also have to describe what you want to do. So, for instance, if you call here coroutine uh, zero zero, uh, then uh, this operator will actually make this function call. So return value is called, uh, and then you can do whatever you want with this value. For instance, you can store it in the promise and make sure that the return object has access to it and can get it out to the caller. Also, after the coroutine, you go here and you have to co-await yet another awaiter. And the waiter that you are waiting here is the result of final suspend. So that has to come from somewhere. So final suspend will give you the final awaiter here uh, that you will await here at this point. Then whenever you call co-await, you have to do something about it. We need an awaiter. So when you call co-await on a function, you call co-await on a, on a tuple, uh, you call co-await on a thread index or a tag, Whenever we call some, an, some expression, we need an awaiter. 
Uh, and there are several ways to do that, but in VJGS, we simply implement a weight transform of some expression in the promise. And when you call core weight, it will call the, 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 the correct weight transform and out comes an awaiter. And then you can, you have the right awaiter and then you can do that. So we've talked about the waiters a lot. So what are they actually doing and, and how can we use them? Now, a waiters manage core weight and core yield. Uh, what, what, is, uh, what, what you do with that? And we've seen that the compiler also adds more code, uh, more core weights uh, than we can actually see. Now, there are default waiters available. They're called suspend always and suspend never. And you can actually use them to inherit some default behavior and just override the behavior that you want. Um, and uh, when, you, when you call core await, uh, then there are different ways to create an awaiter. Um, what VJGS does is actually you call await transform on the promise object, and then you get a proper awaiter. So what happens when you call core weight with an expression? You get an awaiter, but what happens afterwards? Now, this code is a simplified version that I took from Louis Baker's blog entry on, on, on uh, coroutines. So in fact, when you call core weight, um, there is again more code executed than you can actually see. So this code is actually put, uh, or some, something like this is used by the compiler to steer what's happening. And we can immediately see, so first we get an awaiter in our case, so we call this, uh, this transform function, await transform, and we get an awaiter. Okay, so this is implemented in the promise. The promise uh, alters the behavior of a coroutine. Um, so the first thing you do on the awaiter is to call a specific function called await ready. And you see that you only go on and suspend if this function uh, actually returns false. If it returns true, it, it doesn't enter and it doesn't suspend. Now, if it returns false, it goes on and will actually suspend the coroutine. And then after suspension, and that is very important, now the coroutine is suspended. So it really is uh, dormant. But still you call another function on the awaiter that's called await suspend. And here you get the handle of the coroutine as a parameter. Now, what can you do here? Now you know the coroutine is suspended, and now you can actually start another coroutine and tell it, okay, do this, and when you're ready, resume this coroutine uh, that's lurking behind this handle. So this awaiter can start another coroutine, and once that is finished, it can resume this coroutine, and that's very safe because the coroutine is already suspended. Uh, again, we can ask a Boolean if you want to go on here, uh, and if the Boolean is true, then we return to the caller. If it's false, we go on, simply go on re, uh, to this here. And this is the resume point, meaning that whenever you call resume on this coroutine, it actually will enter here, resume all the states, and finally call the last function, uh, which is await resume. And that function actually can return now the result uh, to the caller. So we have a couple of VJS awaiters for the initial suspend. We, we use uh, uh, the default here, always suspend. The final suspend is our final awaiter. And whenever you want to co-await something, um, some functions, uh, a thread, a tag, uh, or you want to yield a value, you need uh, some co-awaiters. And some co-awaiters are lurking here behind and, and help you to, to, uh, to change your behavior. Now, here is the awaiter for a tuple of functions. Uh, we recall that await ready determines uh, whether the coroutine should suspend or not. So, this is an awaiter, uh, and it will uh, implement some, some, uh, some functions. Uh, the first one is uh, await ready. And uh, this, is, this awaiter is called when you want to schedule something, you, you can schedule some functions. Uh, and because uh, you can also um, schedule some, some vectors uh, that might be that might be actually empty, uh, what await ready does it first it counts the number of children uh, that you actually see that you actually want to schedule, and if there are no children, then 
you have to prevent suspension because there's nothing to do. You don't, you shouldn't suspend. So you return true if there are no, if the number of children is actually zero. And that means no suspension here. Now, await suspend uh, goes on. We have seen when this actually goes on. Uh, so now we suspend and then we call await suspend. And what await suspend does is now it goes through all the whole tuple element by element and simply call schedule. So for each tuple element, you call schedule on it and that's it. Now again, um, what can happen is actually that, that you schedule these, uh, these children uh, for a different phase. So if you, if, you, if you schedule any tag value other than minus one, uh, actually what you do is you will actually uh, not suspend, but you will return uh, and, uh, and because uh, you're not really creating children, the, cre the children will are scheduled for a later phase. So again, if the tag value is smaller than zero, um, then we will schedule children. If it's not, uh, if it's not uh, smaller than zero, if it's a valid tag, uh, we will uh, return with one and false. And finally, uh, when uh, the when all the children have been have finished, uh, the parent is resumed, and we can get all the results from all the coroutines uh, and uh, get it back to the caller. So this is what happens when you schedule functions or other coroutines. Uh, this is the await uh, when you schedule a thread index, and that means that you want to change the thread. Uh, and that's a actually very, very simple one. Um, in the await ready, that determines whether you want to suspend or not. You simply check whether uh, the job is already on the, on the right thread. If it's already on the right thread, you don't do anything. Uh, in that case, you return true and there is no suspension. Otherwise, you suspend. You suspend the coroutine and then uh, you, you tell the promise of this coroutine use this thread index, and then you simply schedule the promise. That's it. You call uh, into the job system, schedule job, uh, and schedule this promise, and the promise now has the right thread index. Um, and then you will continue suspending, you go, go back to the thread loop, uh, and uh, this, this uh, promise is put into a queue, and is eventually will take, be taken out by the right thread. So uh, coroutines can return result values. Um, uh, when a coroutine is co-awaiting another coroutine, that's not a big issue because they are in sync. Um, so you can see here, um, if uh, a coroutine awaits another coroutine, uh, coroutine A will actually suspend, coroutine C will run. When coroutine C produces the result, it will again suspend, it will call co-return, it will suspend come back here uh, and then um, A will be uh, resumed. So in this sense, they are com totally in sync. Uh, and um, um, and uh, in fact, uh, the return object of, uh, of this function, which is lurking here, uh, can be used then to destroy uh, the, the coroutine after it has finished. Now, if a function schedules a coroutine, uh, the situation is completely different. You create the coroutine, then you schedule it, and then the function can actually return before the coroutine itself uh, is returning with a result. So the, the parent can return and, and can, can vanish. Now, because the parent is vanished, we have to make sure that the coroutine uh, destroys itself completely independent of the parent. So the coroutine doesn't mind um, if there is a parent or not, it will simply destroy itself. Uh, but what if the parent, uh, the function, tries to get a result from the coroutine, but the coroutine has already destroyed itself because it can never be sure that the parent is still alive. So if you want to access the, a function, uh, the, the return value, the, the promise is gone. So what can you do? Now the, the the um, idea here is to uh, have some outside memory here, put it into a shared pointer, uh, the return object and the promise share this shared pointer, 
And when the coroutine produces its results, it actually puts it into this shared pointer contrast, uh, uh, construct. And uh, when the, the, the return object and the coroutine uh, disappear, then also this will disappear also. Finally, uh, the final awaiter of a coroutine. This is uh, this awaiter here. Uh, and um, uh, this is called when we call co-return. And it's returned by the promise. The promise uh, final suspend is called. It returns an awaiter. And the awaiter is then awaited here. Um, and we have seen uh, that actually um, we have to decide here whether the parent is a function or not. And that determines uh, whether the coroutine will suspend here or whether the coroutine will continue and destruct itself. So first you, 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 you determine whether your parent is a function. Uh, then you, you call your own parent and say, okay, your, this child is finished, so go on. It, maybe you want to finish as well. And finally, if the parent is a coroutine, we suspend because then this coroutine will be destroyed by the parent. But if the parent is a function, uh, we have to destroy ourselves. And uh, this is simply done by returning not is parent function. So that, that's, that's all that's actually necessary here. Uh, and that uh, does the right thing, depending whether the parent is now a coroutine or a function. Now, um, last part, uh, performance considerations. Um, job systems uh, do come with an overhead. <clears throat> we have some work to do. Uh, on the work, we have some overhead that is attached to it. Uh, and of course, the scheduling, managing jobs, queues, this is all uh, overhead. Uh, and um, if the jobs are, are too small or the work is too small, then actually you're all, all you're doing is, is uh, to, to, work, to do the overhead work and not do the real work. So jobs should not be too small, otherwise the overhead would dominate. And what you want to do is to increase the job size uh, if you want to increase the efficiency. But in order to measure that, um, we, want to, we have to come up with some performance metrics uh, and to determine that what, what is really efficient and when is a job actually efficient. Um, so I did some, some experiments and we can uh, define a metric speed up uh, that means that when you have some parallel code, when you run it on one thread, you, you take the time it takes on one thread, you take the time it takes on, on several threads, and then you simply make the ratio of that, and that is your speed up. So as an example, when you run something on one thread and it takes 100 microseconds, and then you run it on four threads, it takes 50 microseconds, then we have a speed up of two. Even though we used four threads, we have only a speed up of two. Now, is that efficient? Is it not efficient? Probably not, not very efficient. Because we actually hope, we are, we are hoping for a speed up of four. If you use four workers, they should be finished in, a, in, a, in one fourth of the time. So we can relate now this speed up to the actual number of workers by dividing it by that, and then we get our efficiency. So in this case, in this example, the efficiency when using four workers is only 50% because we had only a speed up of two for four workers. Now, uh, we can ask some questions. What would be the minimum job size uh, in terms of CPU time, so the size of the job, if you want to have some kind of efficiency like 85 to 95% of efficiency? And you can also ask, um, what is more efficient if you use function pointers, stud function, lambdas, coroutines, and so on. So you can run up uh, a couple of, um, of, of um, experiments. So I did this on my, uh, on my desktop computer. Uh, it contains an AMD Risen uh, with 12 hard hardware threads and 24 virtual cores, uh, 32 gigabits of RAM, and so on. So it's a, it's a, a nice uh, desktop computer with 24 threads. Uh, and I can now start a lot of threads, a lot of jobs. And on the left side, you see uh, the results when I use 12 threads. On the right side, when I use all 24 threads. And uh, here we see, uh, here on this axis, we see uh, the results. Uh, what has to be the minimum job size 
in terms of microseconds worth of CPU work in order to get an efficiency of 85%. This is the, the blue one, so it would be four microseconds. Every job must at least have four microseconds of work uh, in, uh, enabled in, in order to get 90% of um, efficiency, again four, or 95% efficiency, now we are about seven or eight uh, microseconds. Now we have we test the function pointers, which don't come with a lot of overhead. Std function, which is very comparable actually, and coroutines. And all of these come in, in, in two flavors. Uh, one where I do not clock uh, the allocation of the job itself. So I create a vector, put all of the jobs inside. And in one situation, I do not clock this time. And in another situation, I do also uh, include in my timing this job allocation. Uh, and we can see uh, the results here uh, that um, for the function pointers, that functions, it's, it's very comparable for 12 threads. Also for 24 threads, you have to increase uh, the size of the jobs in order to get some a specific efficiency. Uh, but when we come to the coroutines, we see actually two types of behavior. One is if you do not clock the time that it took to create the coroutines, the coroutines are incredibly efficient. And that's really astounding. So when, you when the coroutine is already there and you call it, it's, it's faster than you, you would a function, use a function. That, that's an astounding result. However, if you also include the, co the construction of the coroutine, and we remember uh, the, all the mechanics that you have to do when you run a, when you create a coroutine, allocating, uh, and so on, creating the promise, creating the return object, and so on. But then it can it, it can it's actually not very efficient. Uh, at least if you want to have 95% efficiency, it's very difficult. Uh, but you can if you if you're okay with less efficiency, then coroutines are also fine. In conclusion, uh, I presented the Vienna game job system, uh, which is a thread pool only job system. You can use tech jobs for the phases. Uh, you can combine coroutines with normal functions. You have to take care of, uh, about some things. Um, coroutines can return results. Um, functions can interact with coroutines, but there are complications, as we have seen. Uh, it shows actually good efficiency for large amounts of threads, but if you uh, really continuously create coroutines, then uh, high efficiency is difficult, but uh, if you can live with lower efficiency, coroutines can be very, very efficient, actually. So allocating coroutines comes with a price. And that concludes my talk for today. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, please do ask. Uh, and um, if you want to reach me, uh, drop me an email uh, anytime. Thank you for your attention.